mid early. How about that? Gene is volunteered. To, <laughs> Gene was volunteered to take the prayer this morning. Thank you, Gene. Prayer requests. Yeah. Uh, some of you may even remember, but Hudson, my uh, eight-year-old, almost the part nine, the twenty-first of this month, uh, was complaining.
Okay, that's the last class. <coughs> one more after this, we're all done with the building a biblical worldview. Okay, the, to summarize everything we've done so far, a biblical worldview, we are, as I explained last week, we are fighting against the APP, all right, the American Progressive Paideia, and the only way we're going to win is to bring back the WCP, the Western Christian Paideia. And uh, I do, I do, thank you. <laughs> all right, first of all, does anybody not have a sheet from the week where we covered socially? We had, yeah, all right. Yeah, this is, this is the notes from the last one. We're going back and finishing up. All right, the other thing is, uh, remember way, way back when, at the beginning of the class, I said, after you take the test, we go through the whole course. I'll hand out the test again, a blank, clean sheet of what the test is. If you want to take it again to see if your score's changed, grab a test. If you don't want to take it again, don't grab a test. If you lost your book to have the answer sheets, I got a few answer sheets, not a whole bunch of them. So here is 25, I think, copies of the, of the test again. Uh, and, and again, it's not, not Basically, it's for your own internalization. I'll trade you tests. All right. So if you want to take a test, raise your hand, and we'll uh, we'll do it again. Okay, um, where are we at? We got two more slides to finish up. Let me back up here. All right. These are the last two slides from the how do you deal with a Christian worldview versus social issues. Uh, we have two more slides and then we'll finish up today with education and maybe halfway through. Next week we'll do uh, uh, education and science and that'll be the end of it. We can review anybody that had questions about taking the test again, we can talk about it. Uh, if not, then we can just wrap it up and turn it over to uh, Mr. Twain for the next 13 weeks. All right, social issues. Immoral ideas that are put into practice have consequences. What do you think? How about everything you put into practice has consequences? Yeah, that's like a duh, okay? There's not too much you can do without having consequences as a result of it. Um, Matthew 15, uh, 18, but those things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, and blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat an unwashed hands does not defile a man. So basically, there's, there's our, our Bible verse that says, uh, watch your mouth, okay? What comes out of your mouth is gonna end up getting, getting you into a lot of trouble unless you're really careful, okay? Insert foot here. Uh, so I hope we all uh, strongly agree. All right, the next three. These are uh, the truth statements. We, I've talked about this. In fact, it was the very, very first class over a year ago that I taught on evidences. The very first thing we talked about was what is true? Is there truth? Is there such a thing as absolute truth? We are still, as a country, as a nation, as a world, dealing with the concept of is there a absolute truth? Because most of us, were, most of most of the world would like to believe. No, there's really not an absolute truth. Is like your truth is as good as my truth, as good as his truth, and all that sort of stuff. So the first question is: truth is either non-existent or unknowable. This permeates. You'd be surprised how much of our society is permeated by this lie. This was actually formulated by a guy by the name of Manuel Kant, K-A-N-T. Uh, he was a, a, a philosopher back in the late 1700s, and he. Uh, uh, he basically started this whole movement about what can you know and what can you not know, what is knowing something, what is not knowing something. To summarize, his final conclusion is you can't know anything. I mean, I can look around here and I see a classroom full of people and so forth, but that's what's out there. But really what I am experiencing right now is a somehow a brain electronic compilation of something that looks like this, but I can't prove that that's really out there. It's just what I'm seeing in my brain, okay? And this guy has basically, you know, carried that to the beyond the extreme. You can't know anything, all right? Emmanuel Kant. Well, guess what? There are so many ways of looking at and proving outside of your own brain that this exists. You can know, and there is, in fact, an absolute, an absolute truth, okay? 
So, uh, when, so when someone says to you, you can't know anything, or there is no such thing as absolute truth, you can't know anything, what do you, what do you tell them? How do you explain the differences? Better than that. You can't know anything. You look at my page and I say, how do you know that? <laughs> if you can't know anything, how do you know something? Why should I listen to you? Is that true? There's no absolute truth. Oh, really? Is that true? <laughs> Most of this junk out there is self-contradictory. All you have to do, remember the roadrunner coming off the cliff with the wily e. coyote, just turn the question around and hit it right back again. And almost all of these arguments quickly fall apart. So if someone says there's no absolute truth, uh, you can't know the truth, ask them, how do you know that? Why should I listen to you? All right. Truth is discovered by man, not created by man. How's that created? Yeah. 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 We don't make absolute truths. We discover them. We discover them. Uh, and then the last one is, if it works for you, then it must be true. If it works for you, it must be true. Is that really true? Well, then if it works for you, it must work for me. And what I think, which is totally opposite you, is also true. How do we deal with this? Turn the thing around. Turn the thing around. Okay? You turn it around, it suddenly becomes an absurd concept. All right, John 831. Then Jesus said to the Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And I, I would like to capitalize the word the and the t-truth. Right? It is like the truth. Right? Can we all agree that it's a strongly disagree, agree, and disagree? Yeah, very early. Let's move on. Last slide on social issues. Pastors, pastors and Christians that speak out publicly against homosexuality should be prosecuted for hate speech and a hate crime. Today. Today, yes. <laughs> Today is kidnapping. It really is. It really is. It's not going to be long. Yeah, it really is. And, and really, what are they pushing back on? They're not pushing back on that they want to get married. They're pushing back on affirmation. And now, today, we're dealing with homosexuality, gender issues, all kinds of stuff. But really, when you drill down to it, what most situations like this, and we've had many of them over society's years, what most of these things drop down to is somebody or some group of people get some weird idea they want to go off in this direction, and they don't want you to accept them. They want you to affirm them. If you look out there now, what most of these people are screaming is, I want your affirmation. And if you don't affirm you, I'm going to start by calling you a whole bunch of bad names. And if I can convince my government to do it, lock you up. So it's an affirmation issue. We do not affirm bad behavior. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up to all, in all things into him who is head, Christ. Truth in love. We need to speak the truth, but we need to do it in a loving way. Actually, we need to do it in an agape way. What we're trying to do is help them be better than they are. All right. So, agree or disagree? Disagree? <laughs> okay. Moving right along. All right. One of the greatest virtues one can possess is the virtue of tolerance as defined by our postmodern world. Namely, we accept everyone's lifestyles as equal. Does this sound familiar? That's what they're doing. That right now is unfortunately the majority opinion in the United States. And that, my friends, includes a lot of Christians. Not, not my job to judge, just accept you. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And so how do you deal with that? If you, just, if you have a difference of opinion, 
This, well, I'd like to discuss it. Let me ask you a question first. Are you a tolerant person? And of course, most people can say, of course I'm a tolerant person. Well, here's my idea. I don't tolerate that. All of a sudden, the tolerance disappears. Again, you turn it back on itself, and it becomes a, becomes a laughing point, really. Right. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Does anybody have any difficulty understanding the words there? Any problem exegeting that, dealing with the hermeneutics? That's about as clear as the other verse. Jesus wept, okay? Very difficult to misunderstand. So, do we agree or disagree? Strongly disagree. That is the end of the social issues. I, by the way, in, in the presentations, I, don't, I didn't cover every single test on the question on the test. I just kind of sampled through them. So if there are other questions when you're taking it again, you still have questions about that we didn't cover, then next week we'll spend a few minutes to talk about it. All right, any other questions on social issues? Those are the big ones at the time. Okay, go on to section eight and nine. So this is what I, I'm gonna skip over, this is what I talked about last week. All right, got that slide? That's review. Right okay. Education. Education is going to be the solution to the problem we're facing today with the American progressive paideia. Remember paideia? Paideia is the other kind of education. Education is when you go to school and you learn something, or you learn a trade, or you learn a skill. You can actually do something with it. Paideia is the other side of the education coin, which is where you learn how to live comfortably and uh, behavingly within your society, where you learn the norms of the society. And this is not, it used to be not taught in school all that much, but it was actually taught in the home a lot more and reinforced in the schools. Uh, it is now officially, uh, the idea of a Western Christian paideia is not in the schools. It is literally illegal by the Supreme Court decisions, three court decisions, that as far as I'm concerned are not constitutional, but so there it is. They already have the high ground, they have the corporations, they have the government, they have most of the large social organizations, they have mainstream media. So we are fighting an uphill battle. The only way, as I said last week, the only way we're gonna get back on top before we lose all our rights to speak out is to fight to get WCP back, the Western Christian Paideia back. And we're afraid we're gonna end up having to do it the same way they did it over a generation or two, literally. They took three generations to get here. We can't undo it overnight. But if we don't start, we'll never have an opportunity to undo it. And that's my, that's my two cents. Isn't the United States making some roads positive about just recently, within these last six um, weeks, about all the uh, yes. school boards yes. and so forth going yeah. over conservatives? I mean, I'm not saying that's a, a fit song. But it's it a foot in the door. Like every time you read that, I read a lot about it. And it just seems like they're, they're just, it's overwhelming. Yes. Overwhelming. Yes. Yeah, and school board. COVID is what started. Exactly. As I was going to say, that's the one good thing that happened in COVID. COVID exposed. This has been going on for three generations, almost 100 years, under the covers, right in front of us, while the church is saying, oh, no, no, that's worldly. I can't look at worldly. God, help me. God save me. Well, the world will get to the point where you can't even ask him to save you anymore. Okay. Anyway, you're right. COVID, COVID gave us a peek under the, under the covers. And now people are waking up. Yeah. One good thing for COVID. Okay. The federal government should require that only a federal licensed teacher be permitted to teach or instruct a child in an educational setting. What do you think? All right, change it should only the state. Same thing. I mean, you guys, they're forcing you to teach in the state. Who? The state or the NEA and the AFT? Both. Both. How about homeschool? How do you certify a homeschool teacher? Certified. You have to be certified through the education. Through 
had to. Yeah. Um, I had to. Uh, really? Yeah. Yeah. really? Yeah. That thing's changed now. I think right now there are there are online things that they can do. Yeah. And a lot of them are church-related. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you're getting more and more uh, people pulling their kids out of yeah. public school. Yeah, yeah. It's a very small number, percentage-wise, that are homeschooled. But interestingly enough, the trend is it's like doubling and tripling every year. As you do with COVID. Yeah. COVID again, yeah. yeah since COVID is like four times now, four or five times. Um, they're also talking about maybe taking other professionals in other areas, like military, uh, mm -hmm. and giving them a, a, a one-year crash course or something, some kind of a crash course to get certified. The problem is that in the middle of the other, yeah. the school has just tripled in the last year. And you talk to the mothers, they all say the exact same thing. They want their kids going to public school to be the office. Has anybody here seen the Abeka program? The what? Abeka. Have you seen that program? Yeah. It's a pretty good program. Uh, it's helping spell A-P-E-K-A. -E 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 about all the Galilee teaching in their synagogue. Whoops, did you get certified? Who certified Jesus? God. Did he sign the paper? I didn't need to. He, he spoke the paper and then spoke the signature. <laughs> okay. Whoever therefore breaks with the least of these commandments and teaches men and so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called Great. I should have pulled more context out. But basically, if you're teaching the wrong thing, you're not on God's side, okay? That's that one there in Matthew 5. Um, and so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one, having authority, and not as the scribes. So in addition to Christians getting in there and teaching, we also need to teach with, where cometh thou the authority? Because right now, a lot of the things we're being taught ain't authorized by government, by law, by constitution, by common sense. Wow. Like I children. Yeah, right. History is at age, age 12. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, right. I don't have a section on that. Don't go there. <laughs> school-based health clinics, which would include safe sex counseling and may exclude abstinence. Yesterday afternoon, I was sitting in my living room reading on the internet, uh, on, on the Fox News website, and there was a story about a book that was published just, I mean, like days ago, published called um, sex education for 8 to 12 or something like that. And basically the book was how you teach your children about sex. Well, at the age of 5, 6, 7, 8, invite them into your bed while you're having sex. So that you can start 
to train them up. Maybe they'll leave the door ajar so they can peek in and see and ask and invite them on in and you know, help them participate in sex education by watching mommy and daddy. And this is for eight to 12 as a textbook. <laughs> You're gonna buy that book? Yeah. All right, uh, okay, yeah, so what's our? You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. Yeah, hello, how about you invite your kids in to help? Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. This is the front end of the other verse I should have included. All right, no, no, but absolutely not. We should not be, we should not be in teaching or encouraging or even, we should be push, pushing back on any kind of modification of God's word. When we started these classes, that's when everything just went so hard. That's not my job to teach a child about sex. Well, I don't know, but we've got 11 year olds getting pregnant, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't teach, but we need to teach them something. How about that? That's the parents. Okay. It should be, but well, like we said, if we go back a slide, though, yeah. we don't have families anymore, so yeah. somebody does have to step up. Or you have all these 11 year old girls and 12 year old girls that are getting pregnant. So why don't we go ahead and do a root cause analysis? It's not the class, it's not that book I just talked about, it's not the school, it's not even the parents. It's the fact that we have given God out of our lives. And I'm not saying the parents shouldn't. We've got to break the cycle because now what you talked about was that they've had three genera generations, so the parent uh, now is the one that we're saying you should be teaching your child your parent doesn't think that way. I know. So yeah. uh -huh. how to break that cycle? Starts with us. Look at that. Our kids. If our kids are displaying this kind of stuff, that's where we need to start. Okay. Yeah. I forgot to think of him. One of the best ways is not so much bombarding them with words, but bombarding them with action. You and know, they, they, the world is full of darkness, and we are called yeah. to be light. Yeah. The best sermon that you can do is to be a walking sermon. Yeah, okay. And so, so if we if we show them, this is not the lifestyle you want, try my lifestyle. With agape. With agape. With agape. Correct. Okay. But, but, but we must remember, tough love confronts. Yeah. And we must not be afraid Absolutely. to confront, but to do it with tough love. Sometimes they're part of discipline love. Yeah. Yeah. Just to tell them yeah. you are wrong. So you smack them so they get their attention. And then you give them a little tough love. Right. Some of these young children that we're talking about that are having sex and that are getting pregnant, that is not their choice. I sure do. They need to know something to get out of it if it happens. Yeah. And I don't care who teaches it, but it needs to be taught somewhere. Yeah. Not just the what, but how to, how to deal with it. Well, probably many of the parents didn't expect to have that kind of an influence on their 10 and 11 year olds either. Some of us are in the fog, okay? And people, and well, girls are able to get pregnant a lot sooner than they used to. They're maturing <laughs> yeah. a lot earlier. Yeah. Okay, hopefully we disagree on that. All right, moving on. Okay, the federal government should be directly involved for all students in determining which students go to college and which students go into the workforce and what jobs oh. they will hold. It doesn't do that now. It doesn't do that now. But the Commons countries have been noted She said it's not, doing, it's not happening now. Let me ask you this question. When I took most of my uh, high school and middle school courses, I was taking stuff that like science, and it was actually taught how to think about science, how to analyze science, how to things like that. When I was taught English, yeah, I had to speak in to go on to read good books and think about it and say, well, why does the author say this versus that? And in uh, geography. Uh, all the courses I had engaged my brain to think about beyond what they actually heard, kind of assimilate, get a bigger picture. That was the, that was the taste, the flavor of my education. Today, they're switching over, actively switching over, school boards pushing to switch over, away from the liberal arts courses thinking to STEM courses. What is a STEM course? Science. 
science, technology, technology, engineering, math. Okay, that's a STEM course. What does a STEM course do for you? It gets you a job. It teaches you skills. When you used to take a STEM course in chemistry, do you think you're going to learn about how bonds form? No, you're going to learn about what two chemicals you put together to make this one you can sell for a dollar a pound. They are switching this over, but they're doing it under the covers again. So be careful. Don't be misled. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more. Knowledge and discernment. Knowledge and discernment. That discernment. That means actually engaging the brain, thinking about how it relates to everything else, painting the bigger picture, figuring out the why, not just the what. That you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. And in Luke, now, now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain and prayed, continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose 12 amongst them, 12 whom he also named apostles. All right, the point there is, did he snap that decision? What did he do before he made that decision? Right. Spent the evening with God. Let's talk about this. Let's analyze this. Definitely not a STEM course. Okay. Strongly disagree? Yay, verily. Okay, moving on. Education, values, clarifications, courses, where situational ethics should be taught to students in our educational system. Remember last week I talked about we had to get rid of the word virtue and replace it with value. Virtue means somebody is doing something to get towards a higher goal. Someone is working towards something better than they are now. A virtuous person is working towards that higher goal. What is a value? A value is anything you care about and it doesn't matter if it's virtuous or not, up or down, good or bad right or wrong, that's a value, all right? Just a value. So as soon as they were able, in these last three generations, to get rid of the word virtuous and change it to value, now every value can be accepted. Doesn't that sound like, well, if it's true for you, it's true for me, it's true for him. Every value is valid, okay? We can actually make all values equal. Yeah. The word was changed right under our noses. Who noticed it? Until I started studying it, I didn't notice it. But they changed it. There's about four other words were changed. Like democracy was changed too, but that's another. All right. Virtuous versus values. So if we're talking about values, clarification, courses, or situational ethics, what does that mean? That means we've got teachers standing up there and saying, Okay, who wants to sleep with their mom and dad tonight? Raise your hand. Okay, you're good to go. Who doesn't? Well, let's talk about it. Why don't you? Let's work on those values. I know, it's a little bit kind of perturbing, isn't it? Really? Anyway, so those are his values clarification. Remember, values are okay for everybody and soon to be equal. And then situational ethics, you know, hey, if it's good for you to do it, it's good for me to do it, it's good for everybody to do it, it's okay. Tell that to the cop next time he pulls you over. Well, you may say I was 170, but I felt more like 30. <laughs> Pay that ticket. Go ahead. spacecraft with seven people and oxygen for sex. Those are the, how do you work through the values? Yeah. Comments and notes? All right, let's look at some scripture. John 14, 16, and I pray, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth, 
whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So where do we get our virtuous direction from and what should our values help us do? God's word, God's work, God's will as communicated by his word. And if you're lucky enough to be reached out and touched by an angel, you know, that's some serious thought too. That's where, our, that's where our values should come from and where our virtuous behavior should take us. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. What does that mean, rightly dividing? Examine them and uh, interpret them correctly. Figure out what he wanted us to know. He put that there for a reason. Why? What did he want me to know in that paragraph? Um, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light, light for darkness, bitter for sweet, sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Does that sound an awful lot like what's going on right now? We are literally changing the definition of things to make sound by people go along with it. The Inflation Reduction Act. Huh? If, if it doesn't have inflation reduction, it's accidental. Okay? All right. What do we agree here or not? Strongly disagree? Okay, we'll run along. Science, history, literature, and other advanced educational skills and facts can be taught without religious reference. Oh, oh, should, should, should. I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to rewrite this course. You gotta stop teaching that. Should, should. Okay. Put a should in there. What do you think? Everything in history is based on religion. Yeah. So much religion. Yeah. Yeah. Can anyone name a civilization, a country, a time, and place since the birth of Christ that hasn't been touched in some way, shape, or form by Christ? Do you realize how much they are trying desperately? to rewrite everything we learned from kindergarten up so that Christ is nowhere near that? I will tell you this. I had a student just go in the door and I opened the door and said, do you believe in God? And I was like, uh, yes, we do. He goes, good, me too. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, okay. I don't think we can. I, honestly, if, if you were an honest reporter or an honest writer, or an honest television show producer or whatever, I don't think I don't think you could possibly do your job without somewhere, somehow, including the single most influential fact that's happened in the last couple thousand years. It's everywhere. Science, I love this. Follow the science, not God, follow the science. You cannot even do science without God. The very laws, the very principles, the very mathematics and logic, the very physical constraints that says this chemistry is going to happen with this chemistry, and the physics is going to make this happen, and this is going to happen, and we design lab experiments, and we do it, we test it, and we prove it. All of those laws are God's laws. They are laws because he made them laws, because he created the universe. And the universe has those principles, those characteristics, those laws. And then when you analyze the data, you have to use reason and logic. If this brain is nothing more than a wet slop hunk of something of interactions of atoms that has nothing to do beyond randomness, then there is no such thing as thinking, analytical reasoning. It doesn't exist. If everything we hit goes on in our head is just random molecular motion, my thoughts are no better or different than his or his or his. It's random, folks. It's accidental. No, science cannot work without God. 
literally the scientists that say otherwise have to sit on his lap to slap his face. Anyway, okay, history. No objective view of the world or U.S. history can ignore the influence of God and Christianity. Can you describe the foundations of this country without talking about God? Literature. One example, Shakespeare. 42 books of the Bible he referenced, 2,000 references in his plays. Our language has 247 idioms straight out of the King James Version, such as leopard cheesy spots, salt of the earth, from the flesh, skin of our teeth, and so forth. You cannot possibly deal with any kind of thinking process or communication process that has not been affected by God. Yeah. On the subject of history, there are there is a um, argument that we from that accurate about that of uh, blaming Christianity and, and and or just religion in general for the wars in the world. And um, it's a it's a kind of a common pushback. But if if, if you want to engage it, it's an easy way to 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 counter that would, would be that okay, a lot of the, the and property, and bragging rights. And I was insulted. He slapped me. Yeah. I'm not sure I caught that one. We had wars with religion. Yeah. I would go back and analyze that. The Catholic Church was in the East South American country. You deserve to be a Catholic if you died. Right. That's not in the Bible. No, it's not in the Bible, but it is in the Catholic, it's called the CCC, the yeah. Catechism of the Catholic Church. Through, through uh, things that popes have said, or fact, has been incorporated into fact by definition and a council, and that fact that they've decided actually is above scripture. And right now today, a lot of the problems we have is religion. Yeah. yeah, religion has been blamed for a lot of wars, but most of the wars are because of in people's hearts. They want something that you have. Okay. Remember the three things that basically drive all negative human behavior. Sex, money, power. Sex, money, power. So if you want to analyze your own behavior, you want to start by making sure that you are not being driven by sex, money, or power. Because if you are, you're immediately on the wrong side. Even it may be the right action, it may be the wrong reason, yeah. it's going to be easy. It's going to be difficult. But if we don't get a start, we'll never get there. Yeah, if, if I see someone that needs to just can't be a Christian school, and a mother or a father that's willing to let that happen and support it and give them, get, a, get the kid ready and off to school he goes, I'll find, even if it's a GoFundMe page, we'll, we'll get the kid there. That's the attitude we need to take. We're going to make it happen. Okay. Yeah. But but I see so many fathers that are are home husbands. 
whole structure of the family has pretty much has been pretty much chewed up and spit out by the APP. The APP does not like a uh, nuclear family. The APP absolutely is against and will work hard to make sure the nuclear family dies. I want you and all of your kids to be, I pledge allegiance to the state. That's what they want. And we actually ran out of time. So uh, we had a couple more slides in, in uh, no, that was, that was the last education slide. Next week we do science and I run for the door. All right, thank you. Take care.